and I see Larissa is entering the room, our third presenter. Good morning, everybody. I'm Stylianos Hedipanagos. I'm a uh, Center for Online and Distance Education Fellow, and I will be chairing this session. So we have uh, three presentations and a uh, uh, lot of discussion, I hope. Um, the first presentation is by Simon Caton and Edward Arsted from Goldsmith University of London. And the title is Developing Technological Solutions for Synchronous Social Learning in Online Context. I understand there is a very nice tool behind that, uh, Simon and Edward called Handel, correct me if I'm wrong. That is and you will talk to us about that. Over yeah. to you, Simon, and then Edward. Okay, thanks. So I'll just introduce, I'm, I'm Dr. Simon Tan. And I'm Dr. Edward Anstead. Um, and uh, I'll, let me just share my screen. Great. And so um, the first thing we should say is that this was a project that was initially funded by University of London Centre for Online Distance Education. And now we're in the process of transforming this into a Goldsmith spin-off focused on collaborative learning at scale. So the primary impetus for Handle um, was a problem that I'm sure many of you here today have also experienced. As the pandemic hit, we had to shift rapidly from teaching scenarios like represented by the image on the left to the sort of scenarios on the right. And there are many good things about this left-hand scenario. So there's multiple streams of activity. There's rich interaction happening, not only between the students themselves, but also between the teachers and the students as they move around the room, skillfully monitoring the activity and intervening where necessary. But on the right hand side, of course, we've got a single stream of activity. And not only do the, does the application um, constraints reduce the amount of interaction, but we now know that the students themselves in this environment further reduce the interaction. So I'm sure many of you will have experienced that rather than having their cameras on, like we can see in this image, most students opt to turn their cameras off, for example. And what we found personally was that this led us into a very teacher-centric approach um, in our classes, but we'd long been trying to escape. So as we thought about developing an online tool, we considered also considered the problems of the physical classroom. So for one thing, getting support is really frustrating. You have to raise your hand, and whilst you've got your hand raised, you can't work. There's no queuing system. Um, so somebody might cut in front of you, they might be louder, it could be really unfair. And crucially, there's no information for the instructors either. So they can't tell what your question is. And that's likely to make for a really inefficient workflow where instructors repeatedly ask to say, answer the same questions over and over again. Um, another problem is that the, the groupings in these classrooms are fixed. So for example, this student can only work with this student on the left and this student on the right, maybe some around the table. Where in reality, in one point in the class, they might really benefit from being grouped together with this student over here and this student over here, because they have exactly the same problem at that period moment in time. And so in the physical classroom, opportunities for social learning are also being lost. The final impetus came from our experience of delivering online courses at scale with the University of London. So it struck us that these could be really solitary experiences for our learners. Um, interactions mostly happening via asynchronous forums. And these suffer from low fidelity communication and long turnaround times. And the result is a focus away from active learning and towards st our students eliciting a kind of service-like support from the tutors. We introduced Zoom webinars at one point to address this, but these have had really poor attendance. So this creates a frustrating dynamic between students and tutors, which uh, surely is re affecting course retention. So this, all this left our platform with the following aims. We wanted to increase and improve social interaction. And we wanted to do this by uh, improving uh, the teacher workflows um, to allow for spontaneous reorganization of the cohorts around their interests and needs. 
And we wanted to use a social media like design to nudge students into better engagement. So um, what we ended up was, with was this. It's a platform designed around three elements, which you can see here on a screenshot of the instructor dashboard. So on the left in green is micro sessions. These are instructor led sessions and they're closest to a regular Zoom call. They're created by the instructor either prior to the session or they can be created on the fly during the class. And you, they can be made optional to allow multi-track sessions. So for example, where you've got multiple instructors and you want to provide differentiated material for your students. And they can also be made compulsory for moments of cohesion. So for example, when you want to bring students together at the start and the end of a class. Study groups, um, which are in the middle in yellow, are for learner to learner activity. These are like breakout rooms, but with topic headings and a set of other functionality. They can be created by instructors before the session, or they can be created by students themselves during the session. And students can freely move between these. A key feature is that study groups allow, um, dynamically subdivide as students join them. So for example, if an instructor has 100 students in their uh, class, and they create two study groups, one for those students who want to study the assignment and one for those students who want to do exam revisions. And say 30 of them, the students choose to do the assignment. Then what will happen is that the platform will subdivide this into say five or six separate study groups on the fly so that there are only five or so students in each study group. And the remaining 70 students would be subdivided into 14 or 15 other ones to study exam revision. And these uh, numbers of study groups, these groupings can dynamically change um, as students choose to move between the different groups. The final element is uh, called raised hands, and these are for learner to instructor communication. We avoided the term question as we wanted to embrace uh, wider moments of curiosity and eliciting feedback and so on. So students post tweet length raised hands, which start from a range of prompts such as I'm curious about or I'm struggling with. Instructors then respond with a video callback where the student is automatically pulled out of whatever current activity they're doing um, to be put with the instructor. A key feature is that other learners who can see these questions and if they're relevant to them, they can choose to follow them. And then when the instructor calls back, they get a cho choice, a chance to join that call as well to hear the answer. So students navigate all these elements through their own interface, which has social media inspired elements such as friends and a social feed. A key feature here is that they can follow those elements that they're interested in as they appear. Edward. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'm now going to talk about the evaluations that we've conducted so far with the Handle platform. So we conducted um, a sensitising user trial where we have uh, three separate focuses. So these will run uh, in turn, each with two large uh, class um, scale sessions um, for each of these different focuses. So I'm going to organise our results and our discussions around these three focuses. So in our first, um, we gauged initial impressions uh, with the platform. Uh, so understanding students' acceptance and the benefits of the key functionality that Simon's just described. From that, we moved on to um, study group task lists. So where we um, increased the, um, the structure around the tasks that students conducted within study groups. And then finally, um, also, the inclusion of social media like interactions. So Simon touched on this in the last slide, the, um, the introduction of friends mechanism, mechanisms, avatars, um, as well as some sort of asynchronous um, interaction as well. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide, slide, slide Simon. Um, so as I said, Handle was evaluated through these three focuses and each of these three focuses we had two uh, learner sessions for. Um, so we used uh, computer science students um, and these students were on the introduction to um, programming uh, module uh, on the University of London BSc programme. So uh, an entirely online um, programme. 
Um, these were non-compulsory sessions. We didn't want to directly interfere with the curriculum that was being uh, provided. Um, but they did um, sort of add additional content um, and additional practice for those students that decided to come along. So this will be in addition to the sort of the VLE provided forums and the, the online webinars that students would have done. And in each session, we had an average of around 55 students, and that was 213 individuals in total. So some students did attend multiple of the sessions. Um, in terms of data collection from these sessions, we conducted uh, post-student, um, sorry, post-session student surveys um, after each one, um, where we sort of gauged students' uh, responses to the various features and the various focus of, of that particular interaction. Um, and you can see that summarised on the table on the right there. So in terms of our, our, our overall platform results, so this was our, our first session and what we investigated. Um, in general, very positive response to handle as a platform and in relationship to this classic Zoom webinars that they were having. So um, we got around 86% of students said that they preferred the handle session to their, their Zoom webinars. Obviously, there's two layers going on here, that there's the platform and then there's the session itself. So extracting exactly what they liked about the platform from this is is, is maybe a little challenging, but it's still sort of very positive um, response to the, the application in general. And 80% uh, of uh, survey respondents also said they would like to have regular handle sessions. So they'd like them either weekly or every other week. And the micro sessions, so those teacher led sessions where students all came together and had a, a degree of instruction, that was the most preferred um, of the sessions for students. So, so during the session, 69% of them uh, rated this as their favourite part. And um, we think that might be, looking at some of the other comments, uh, that it kind of provides a point of cohesion, a point where students all come together and then from that they can come off and do their self-directed learning. Uh, if you go to the next slide, thank you. Um, also within that session, we looked at uh, study groups, so the small breakout activities. 73% um, of students had an effective one-to-one -one or small group interaction with a tutor. So as part of those, those study groups, tutors would join the, uh, the sessions um, and would talk with students um, as well as the hands up. And um, not only did uh, students interact with a tutor, but it was also an effective interaction. So that meant that they actually um, it helped them with their, their, their overall learning goals. We had quite positive feedback on the social aspects. So um, at the start of the session, we asked students to um, join together, introduce themselves, get to know each other. We think that might be a lot because these are, you know, these are online students. And here was a, a good opportunity to meet a small, a small group within a cohort, get to know them and get to do some work with them. Um, Students were, were more neutral in how these groups actually facilitated activities. Um, our, our method for, for joining students together um, maybe could be improved um, with that in mind. Um, in terms of uh, raising hands, um, we did see slightly lower engagement with this, although the students that did use it did really um, enjoy it and really benefit from it and um, so our, our reset response to that looks quite neutral but those that did actually use it seem to be quite positive as uh, Simon if you can and um, in the second session this is where we introduced the the learner tasks so we utilized a third party um, collaborative programming tool so students would use that tool uh, to undergrade undertake a task in this case they were building a, a simplified version of Frogger and Handle provided them with a list of to-dos, so separating out the various tasks that we'd set for them, dividing it between them as individuals, getting that group dynamic going, um, and also it gave them a checklist of things they could work through and a timer as well, so they knew how long they had to um, do the task. Um, students rep responded that this um, helped them focus and it was preferable to um, more traditional written instructions, giving them that bit more um, kind of focus and, and to work through um, the tasks individually. Um, and the final um, session we did, we looked at these social media uh, interactions. Um, so there were um, there were several of these interactions that were added in. Uh, so friends, uh, avatars, 
um, where students could pick a little icon that, they, that represented themselves. Um, we had um, a pre-session social, so before the class, um, students could join together, talk about the issues that were coming up. And also we had a, um, a pre-raised hand feature. So that meant that students could um, raise their hand with an issue they were having with coursework or with um, some other part of the, um, the material. They could raise their hand in advance and we could um, hopefully better um, coordinate that process of, of having one-to-ones with students. So um, quite positive results again on these features. Um, so out of a, a Likert scale of one to five, um, the friends at scored an average of, of 3.8 out of five and the pre-session social uh, 3.6 out of five. Um, but what we did see was, was fairly limited increase in participation with this and also how that participation helped engagement with the platform. Um, to an extent, we, we took sort of a knowingly quite naive approach to this feature in integration. So we, we, we set up an email campaign. So students uh, receive an email saying, um, you know, uh, create a profile, create an avatar, make friends um, through sort of in the build up weeks to the task, uh, or to the session rather. Um, but that didn't seem to be a, a long enough period to really embed these features. So there's, there's kind of more work to do, I think, to understand how these really integrate with Handle and the way that students learn on the platform. So Simon, back to you. Thanks. Um, so in conclusion, um, the platform had certainly um, become popular um, and we definitely did increase social eng engagement within the sessions compared to what was going on with our um, equivalent Zoom webinars. But given the limited extra functionality which we were able to implement within the scope of our study, one wonders why we got such a strength of response from our students. So there's a number of possible explanations. Um, as Edward already alluded to, um, it's probable that the greater effect of resources and effort that we put into these sessions um, had some effect and we're unable to isolate for this. But I would also argue that the affordances of the design from the instructor perspective led us into delivering more active modes of learning and better differentiation of our material. And also through its social media presentation, Handel perhaps gave our students a greater sense of agency and communicated an expectation of interaction within the session. Since this study, we've attempted to further develop and disseminate Handel as a commercial product for higher education. And as we've done so, we've encountered a number of challenges ranging from the practical to the commercial. So in the online space, uh, globally distributed students, many of whom hold full-time jobs, demand greater degrees of flexibility than our real-time sessions could provide. We also found that online courses had neither the quantity nor duration of taught sessions to provide the necessary density and quality of social learning experiences. So from the commercial perspective, we found that the, also the return to normal had reduced demand but also that now established tools such as Zoom and Teams had created a broad feature space that now had to be met aside from our socially oriented design. In response to this, we've refocused Handle more specifically towards providing real-time activities for students in small groups. So these are automat automatically facilitated and gamefully designed to promote low risk and equal participation from the students involved. Key to all this is that the activities can happen both inside and outside the classroom. And this affords flexibility for students about when and how often they engage, but also allows more time for deeper engagement with those activities. So at the moment we're doing iterative development through trials with another cohort of introduction to programming students. Please do ask us anything you want about our work. But if you're delivering a module perhaps at University of London worldwide, then we'd also love to work with you. Handle is uh, just now an approved supplier with University of London, so hopefully it would be relatively straightforward um, to try something out. Great, great. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Simon and Edward. I think Zoom has got a serious competitor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, 
can I ask the audience if you have any questions? I saw that at least uh, one question has been posted on the chat function. But if you would like to ask these questions uh, in real time, please raise your hands and you have the opportunity to do so. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes for discussion and questions. So let's go for it. Um, I saw, shall we start with a question that Anna asked? And I think uh, Edward responded to this. It was a question about scalability, really. Yeah. And uh, um, staff, staff to student ratio. And uh, I had a similar question because uh, in quite a lot of these land technology solutions, people think about uh, scalability. And people think about how scalable a particular tool is, and how easy to achieve this kind of scalability. Uh, could, you, could you say anything about this? Um, yeah, so that was definitely one of our, our, our aims was to kind of magnify the, the feeling of presence of, of, the, of the course instructor there. So we had multiple things, things for um, managing the workflow. Um, so when you have multiple instructors, how do you coordinate them on a call and make best use of them? Um, so with our system, we could have multiple instructors doing different things at the same time and interacting with different students. Um, and then also we had um, a kind of, it was pretty fledgling, there wasn't much of it developed, but a, a sense in which announcements and things could be made to give the students, say in study groups, a greater sense of the presence of the tutor, even if the tutor isn't actually joining their group in a, in a video call. Um, so yeah, it was definitely it was definitely much in in mind. Now in the direction that we've gone uh, with this kind of synchronous asynchronous model, so the outside of classroom, it's very much more scalable because what we're trying to do is get these students to do peer to peer learning, interacting with with each other, um, as opposed to kind of instructor led activities. Okay, excellent. This makes sense. Any other questions from, from the audience? I have a, I had a couple of questions, but um, uh, until these questions uh, uh, crop up, the thing I wanted to comment to com to comment you on is uh, evaluation, and you seem to uh, have gone through a very thorough evaluation. I'm saying that because uh, that's not the case always with uh, with um, land technology solutions having this very thorough evaluation. And uh, there was a strong formative aspect, which uh, I'm sure informed uh, uh, different iterations of the product you, you produced. So uh, uh, very well done on this particular aspect. The thing I wanted to ask in relation to that, um, did you have any uh, considerations in your thinking about how this product work with set cat categories of, of, uh, of students. So for instance, students that have uh, special needs, visual impairment, to make an example. Did you, did you um, think about that? How did you include this kind of aspect to your thinking about the development of the tool? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think um, the first thing is, you know, accessibility is always something that you have to think about when you're designing a web like a web-based tool and mm. so that's kind of built into the front end design those those concerns you know making sure just things like um the it works at different magnifications and it's tabable and screen reader friendly and so on um i think the probably the biggest consideration and something that's uh very difficult to know how to to deal with is um that many of the the students uh, on the UOL, on that UOL program at least, but I'm pretty sure most of them have issues with bandwidth. Um, mm. And actually, even within the UK, the the, um, the statistics are not particularly good for students' access to bandwidth. And obviously, that's also intersectional with a whole bunch of other things, um, uh, you know, de other demographics uh, that are not advantageous to students. And so I think this is this is one of the problems with with real time um, that that needs to be considered. So on the one hand, we want this kind of rich 
much richer communication that can happen. Um, but but yeah, the, the 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 poor access to to Wi-Fi and also working spaces is re is really tricky. Okay, that's a very important point, Simon. I think uh, uh, about the proliferation of these tools and uh, challenges for for audiences, especially if they're outside the UK and uh, distant learners that do not have uh, the access to to connection and to uh, Wi-Fi that we take it we take for granted sometimes in the UK. But I find even the UK people. Our stu students have sometimes severe problems of accessing uh, real time uh, or work in, in real time environments that uh, need to have the support of internet access. Yeah, it's definitely widespread. I mean, uh, I was reading the the latest GISC report around this. I can't. I don't want to make up the number because I can't remember it off the top of my head. But it's it's into tens of percent um, that you're that you're looking at. It's not a, it's not a small proportion of students. Who struggle with Wi-Fi um, access, um, but I, one thing I would say was, you know, uh, but maybe we we didn't really mention in the presentation was the um, the effect on us as instructors as well. So, th running this course, you know, we put a lot of work into the kind of uh, developing this module as a real kind of flagship, innovative piece of work when we built it back in 2018. Um, but then the actual running of the course is, has, is, has always felt quite impersonal, actually, because, uh, because of the modes of communication, because mostly we're just dealing with issues where things have gone wrong with assessment and so on. So these sessions really allowed us a chance to actually meet our students, and it made a huge difference to how we felt about the module as instructors, just having that rich communication. Suddenly I was, you know, on a, on a video call with someone in uh, Kenya and someone in Singapore and uh, you know, Costa Rica at the same time and you go wow this is actually a really global degree and the sense of excitement of those students meeting each other was also very palpable. Mm, that's uh, that's uh, extremely significant in a distance learning context creating this sense of community uh, from different parts of the world I find this extremely fascinating but you touched on uh, on, uh, on staff and uh, staff involved. And what comes to mind is workloads and how uh, uh, full involvement of anything with anything like that can, can uh, uh, have an impact on uh, how people manage uh, assimilating this kind of tool in the teaching practice. What, what, what is the impact? Or there are hidden uh, or obvious benefits there that, um, uh, manage the whole package of workload if we go to the workload it's a standard question I think yeah. we ask people okay fine I will adopt that it's, um, it's wonderful however it's going to take quite a lot of my time in addition to what mm -hmm. I'm doing right now yeah yeah and I think that this is this is part of the uh, part of the difficulty with the uh, with our original kind of focus on on the synchronous taught sessions um, at least as far as the way that we do Goldsmiths courses, uh, we expect as module leaders to run three webinars, uh, so one at the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. And the other ones are then taken by online tutors. And um, essentially that's kind of structurally how these have been set up. And so that, that, that made things difficult for that version of the platform because um, essentially it, it you know, if you, if you really want to get something out of this scenario, you'd want to be running regular webinars to try and build the connections between students and to develop the behaviours. And that obviously in turn with that model starts putting pressure on, on the module leaders. So this is the kind of the motivation partially behind trying to make something that's much more uh, student led rather than something that's so kind of focused on the tutor delivery. Great. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think we reached to the to the uh, to the end of this uh, uh, subsession, to the end of this presentation. I would like to thank you both. This is a very exciting development. I want to ask, what's this Frogger game you refer to? 
<laughs> it's a very old computer game from I think probably the late 1970s, but it yeah. appears again and again and again. Yeah. So um, the, the idea is you have to get the, the frog to cross the road and the stream okay. without getting run over. Uh, okay. Uh, Simon's put a link to the Wikipedia <laughs> right. in the chat. Oh, I will explore that link. Oh, <laughs> uh, great, if you great. see it, you may well recognise it. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm sure I will, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of retro computer games. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Thanks. both. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, presenter is Pete McDonald from the Royal Agricultural University in the UK. And uh, as you were saying before we start the session, um, the conference committee loved your title. That was not the main reason why you were selected. Uh, you were selected because that was a very good initiative, very, very, very robust abstract. But we loved, we loved the your title, and we are uh, we very we are very keen to to hear all about it. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to for allowing me to do my thing. All right, um, let the adventure begin then. Um, so, okay, Indiana Jones and the annotators of the Lost Ark. Uh, we're going to be exploring the possibilities of social annotation within a very unique context, so Technology Enhanced Transnational Learning, or TETL for short. I really enjoyed creating the, uh, that uh, shortened version there. Um, so, um, obviously, um, good morning, everybody. My name's Pip. Um, I work at the Royal Agricultural University in the capacity of a learning technologist in the digital innovation team. Um, as you know, uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, was a film from the 80s. Most of you, I hope, will have enjoyed that um, from the 80s. Um, a, a, quite a famous film directed by Steven Spielberg and uh, written by George Lucas, starring Harrison Ford. So basic storyline involved um, a character, uh, Indiana Jones, embarking on an adventure to find an arc. So I took this to a new level and explored the idea of a digital arc. So what could a digital arc of practice be for distance learning and online learning? And have we found it yet? All right, um, well, Indiana Jones always put his hat on, so perhaps I should put mine on. Um, so what I'm gonna do Today is I'm going to briefly talk about uh, technology enhanced language learning as, a, as an area, uh, the implications of the pivot uh, and the unique pedagogical challenges. Um, I'm go also going to explore previous research related to the Indiana Jones theme. Then we'll go do a bit of a deep dive in social annotation um, and look at the mini investigation that I carried out and the results. All right, so as part of a, a long-standing transnational partnership uh, with uh, Shandong Agricultural uh, University in China, usually our, our lecturers fly over to China and deliver uh, traditional face-to-face -face sessions. Um, these are standalone modules, so then um, they take about three weeks um, and they can be shared modules. And obviously like everybody else seemed to do due to the global pandemic, you know, teaching and learning moved online. And this happened in a number of different ways. So we went from pedagogy to Pan demagogy. So this happened in two main ways. So first of all, we, we, we held interactive sessions on Zoom and then lecturers were invited, encouraged and supported to uh, create pre-recorded lectures on Panopto. There's nothing new about those two things, but this is a story that has been told many times over the past, past two years. Um, but uh, it's, it's unique because of the uh, transnational online pivot. So it wasn't just a pivot, it was a pivot within a pivot, a meta pivot that was uh, very unique to a transnational context. And it carried its own series of technical challenges from a learning technology point of view and from a pedagogical point of view. What, why are we talking about this? Why is it interesting? Why is it re relevant to, to distance learning and online learning? Well, um, in 2021, Universities UK published a report exploring this, um, this state of UK transnational online uh, higher education. And it was as a result of the, uh, the findings of the task and finish group. Um, uh, and uh, quite frankly, it, 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 it puts it all into perspective. So this, you know, they estimated that about 400,000 students um, were receiving, uh, engaged in, in, in uh, education through digital means. Um, 
so that represents 60% of the total number of, of transnational students. So that provides some perspective on why, um, why I'm doing this presentation. Um, uh, you know, all right, so why, um, you know, the unique, in terms of the unique pedagogical uh, challenges and why um, I decided to research the hell out of them. So after about two years of online learning, what emerged was this, that um, how on earth can we create a meaningful interactive session? Um, go back to your teacher training and ask yourself, what is interactive learning? and How do I know it's taken place? The challenge was that we had about 150 students in one Zoom session. So that's a lot of Zoom Pro licenses and a lot of people to engage and include. Um, and that's really hard. So you're one lecturer with 150 students. That's hard. That is a challenge. So we tried what everyone else was doing with, you know, things like polling, breakout rooms and VVox. VVox was um, um, a game changer. So VVox um, is a kind of polling tool, but also has some other, other features such as Word Cloud that makes the polling experience and Q&A experience more exciting. So uh, one way that I thought we could try to um, engage students interactively uh, and also collaboratively was to use social annotation. Now Zoom has its own annotation feature and it also has uh, the opportunity for you to use a whiteboard. They're slightly different, but you can smash them together to create a learning experience. Let's, so let's just put this in context. So Indiana Jones has been a bit of a, a theme for, for, the, for, the two, uh, for the two years um, leading up to this. Um, and a number of research projects were carried out in terms of technology enhanced transnational learning. Uh, one of the main outputs, one of the main threads was our digital transformation blog at the RAU. Um, it's a WordPress flat platform. Um, it's very simple, there's, it, there's nothing new, but it allowed us to create a China series of blog posts over two years. Um, and it, there was this kind of emerging workflow of how do we make sense of what, what's going on? What the hell is going on? Let's get it down in a blog. Right, let's go back. So Indiana Jones and the Temple of Zoom. So we're in a, we're in a digital temple right now. Uh, we're all digital archeologists somehow as a metaphor. Uh, so this was um, a research project um, that uh, had an output at the University of Kent at their digitally enhanced education webinars. And, um, and it, it explored the idea of uh, the online, the brave new online digital classroom as Blake called it in 2013. So it felt like a, a, as a learning technologist, all of a sudden we're in the limelight. Um, perhaps we were taken for granted before, um, and we were supposed to be the trailblazers of this digital adventure. So we were supposed to take all the lectures with us on this journey. So I used metaphor to understand a period of change and to make sense of changing professional identities. So as Lakoff and Johnson said in 2003, human thought process are, processes are largely metaphorical. Perhaps we take it for granted. Really interesting book coming out by Martin Weller to explore metaphors explicitly within education technology. So could we understand the pivot as a metaphor? Um, one of the most interesting uh, examples of using metaphor in education technology was um, a paper that came out in 2020 by Farrelly, Costello and Donlon talking about the VLE as um, a, a, in metaphorical terms. So there were six metaphorical concepts, one of which is a digital car park. So, when is a VLE a digital car park? If we think about it in that way, does it change the way we design an experience? So we think about the, the temple of Zoom itself. Um, so in, 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 the, in the film with Indiana Jones, he faces a series of challenges that he has to navigate through. So did we. Um, what sort of difficulties have you uh, explored uh, and faced? Um, what sort of uh, challenging temples have you had to get through? Um, how do we exist? How do students exist uh, within Zoom? How, how are we existing in Zoom? So there's this kind of ontological uh, inquiry that's kind of ongoing and how, what sort of epistemological exchanges take place in a digital temple. Um, so then this moved on to Indiana Jones and the breakout tombs, of course. We've all experimented with a breakout room. Um, I've had experience of doing it really well and um, have over-promised and under-delivered and, and not done it so well. 
So I explored um, using an escape room in a breakout room in Zoom to explore the idea of critical Zoom literacy. Uh, we assumed that students could use Zoom, but we didn't support, it, support them through it enough. Um, and also I wasn't totally happy with the idea of a critical Zoom literacy, because if we understand literacy to be a commodity, then it, it kind of questions the, the, the tools that we're using and, and combining literacy with um, specific tools. So that was presented at the Collaborative Action Research Conference in October 2021 with a corresponding blog post. So one of the things that came out of that is um, try and do try and um, adopt team teaching approach to manage large numbers of students in an online classroom. There's nothing new here. It's about asking ourselves, what do the good teachers do anyway? All right, let's look at this whiteboard business. We hadn't used the whiteboard very much. Um, but um, we, we felt that actually the affordances, the learning affordances from it in terms of collaborative, uh, synchronous, real-time collaboration, multimodal learning, um, were, were possibly going to help us create an interactive session that's meaningful. Zoom have released a new whiteboard, which has um, an asynchronous option. So that is very helpful um, in terms of uh, developing um, social annotation and the use of the whiteboard in future. So when does the interactive whiteboard become interactive? So it's not inherently interactive, it's about how we use it. It doesn't have innate pedagogical properties. So it becomes a question of how do you teach with yours? An annotation is separate but can be used together. So we could actually do one now, but I won't, I promise. Um, so I, I started to go back. Uh, what is a whiteboard? Who invented it? Um, why do we use it? Um, there wasn't a lot on it other than um, somebody called, I can't remember his name, but it was very strange. It came from the 1950s and then emerged again in the 60s. I then went back to the Victorian classroom. So um, at a university, um, at a, in, in a museum in the Northeast, uh, they emulate uh, Victorian lessons and they use mini chalkboards. So there's this idea of um, the whiteboard being used and uh, and evolving throughout educational history. So from Indiana Jones to Back to the Future. So what does the literature, literature say about a whiteboard? Um, I think in terms of pedagogic use of whiteboard, uh, particularly uh, from the ideas of Hayden in 2013, it's important to acknowledge that a teacher needs to be good at three things. One, their subject knowledge. Secondly, they need to know how to teach it, but certainly the past two years have proven that actually you need to be able to teach it online. So this is kind of digital holy trinity of an evolving professional identity. Uh, social annotation. One definition I, I found from the Centre for, for Teaching and Innovation from, uh, from this year is that it's reading and thinking together. So that's a very broad uh, definition and it perhaps doesn't do it enough justice. So annotation on its own, collaborative note taking, but what makes it social? Um, is it not already social enough? Um, and also one of the critical questions I wanted to ask was can annotation in its social capacity support students in a second language context? Um, so going back to the history of annotation, um, obviously it was a very interesting um, journey. Um, thinking about annotated books that were used um, as a kind of social activity. Um, really good book by Kalir and Garcia just called Annotation uh, that drills down into what is a note, what is a text, and then thinking about intertextuality. So describing the relationship between an annotated text and the original text. So there's lots of layers here uh, of annotation. So what did I do? I asked a series of questions. Um, some open, some closed. Uh, it was, we used Microsoft Forms, a very simple, straightforward evaluation at the end of a session. I presented three Zoom scenarios. So it's a scenario-based scenario, scenario -based learning, um, uh, situ learning situation around muting the mic, using the chat and sharing screen, quite basic Zoom functions that we can't take for granted. So I used uh, annotation. So I shared screen and enabled annotation and allowed the students to, um, contribute to these uh, three stimulus 
questions and scenarios. I then followed it up with a sticky question uh, or a wicked question, which is uh, which was how to make, how can they make the most of their interactive sessions in their capacity as, as students. So um, second language learning context, often students are very, very shy to, to make a mistake. So this wasn't about a right or wrong answer um, and it wasn't an assessment in English. So it's quite important to think about it from their point of view. So the results were there were about 40 students in the research population. Students were invited to fill in this online form at the end of the session. So, for example, I asked them, how would you describe social annotation? How would they define it? Never mind what I define it as. So they said it was um, an opportunity to strengthen the connection between people. And they also said what would be particularly interesting for, for distance learning, it shortens the distance between people. So bear in mind that these are second language learners, so we might have some mistakes. Um, and what came out of that, the responses from that question was that distance learning gives us an opportunity to think about perceptions of distance and distance again as a metaphor. Um, they also find it, I think the direct quote was useful. They did find annotation very useful. And then they said, it is a tool to help the class have the class. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, I asked them whether they felt that social annotation actually helped them contribute in the session or whether they would prefer uh, a more traditional approach. So 37 out of the 40 students um, agreed that it, it would help them. Um, the majority of students would like more social annotation um, activities. So this can help us improve the, the interactive sessions in future. And they would also like to use the whiteboard. So for the sticky question, I used the whiteboard and for the scenario-based um, um, task, I used just annotation on its own. So I asked them, look, how did the Zoom whiteboard help to make the session more interactive? So a couple of the interesting responses, they felt that it, it helped them to answer questions easier, uh, direct quote, and they also quite like the visual aspect, the creative aspect. So um, a lot of the, the whiteboards that I took screenshots of uh, had a lot of color and a lot of paint. Uh, there was um, a risk at one point that they were looking a bit like a Jackson Pollock painting. Um, but uh, so the, the learning for me is that I need to make sure that if they want to contribute, they don't just like draw all over the screen because that is a risk, a risk that that can happen, which takes them off task. I asked them what the benefits of social annotation, what they felt the benefits were, uh, are of social annotation. So not what I think, uh, what they thought. Uh, really interesting response. Just one word, responsibility. So there's this interesting idea of creating an activity that gives them a bit of ownership and a bit of a creative, collaborative ownership. Also, as learning technologists, sometimes we overpromise and underdeliver, and I don't want to do that. So I asked them, what are the drawbacks of this? Let's be realistic. This isn't going to be an all singing, all dancing solution for everybody. So some of the feedback was the whiteboard is too small. Uh, it got into a mess very quickly. Um, they were worried about the time it took to fill in a whiteboard. So they need to be focused. So things like using De Bono's thinking hats uh, could focus a lot of the group work. So there's six thinking hats, different colors with a specific focus, such as risk and creativity. So ways that we curate online collaboration. So Indiana Jones will return. Um, the most recent film, uh, the Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, will return as the Kingdom of the Digital Skull. I'm not sure what that could be yet, but I'm quite excited. Um, in terms of the future then, uh, mapping that future, um, I'd like to look, revisit student induction with them, the students, um, trying not to assume, whoops, sorry, trying not to assume that they know how to use Zoom. Um, and maybe getting them involved in developing um, learning resources on how to support each other with Zoom, make, how to make the most of the session. I'd also like to um, develop uh, resources around best practice and second language learning. Um, I used to teach English for academic purposes. Um, so I'd like to explore that um, in future. Other social annotation tools such as Hypothesis, um, and other white, uh, collaborative whiteboards such as Miro, the Google Jam board, using a mobile device. Um, a really interesting tool called Gather Town that I explored. Um, 
another another best practice around VVOX, which we've actually found has been a bit of a game changer. Um, something else that's really interesting is the idea of agile stationary. So it's essentially um, stationary, stationary that can go across, it's virtual stationary that can go across a blended environment. So if you're going to blend it, you blend it like Beckham. Now, so it's essentially, I don't think you can see that, but it's um, cards with pictures on. It's quite simple. So it's an example of dual coding. So students could explore found objects in their environment and add them into the online classroom. Another example is Rory's Story Cubes. I don't know if you can see that, but it's a little cube with a picture on. So um, in the past, we've tried collaborative storytelling online. So digital storytelling as a way to improve the interactive sessions. So thanks very much for listening. Um, I think Indy would be very proud. Uh, feel free to contact me. Um, my Twitter handle is at pitmax6 and my email address uh, is, is, is there. So um, I hope you found that useful. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Pip. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and I, th I think we have some time for questions. And so we start with Simon. Simon has asked, uh, he put a question on, uh, on uh, the chat function. Simon, would you like to come in? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, thanks, Pip. Yeah. It was really, it was such an interesting uh, presentation. Like, and it really struck me how many uh, points of kind of, so we, how, we, how we'd face similar problems um, as well. Um, yeah, I just sort of wondered when I, I had tried um, various whiteboard experiments in the past and found the difficulty was that the larger the number of students, I think you kind of referred to this, like the more the more the mess um, that you get on the whiteboard. So I wondered what you'd done with kind of pre -lay have you done any work around pre laying structure out beforehand or any attempts at organizing the students in that way? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, so what I noticed actually in Microsoft Teams, which is the other platform that everyone seems to use, the ubiquity of Microsoft Teams, in their whiteboard experience, um, they have some interesting templates uh, to kind of help students structure their thoughts in a specific way. Um, and I think that they, they're grouped into different uh, themes. So I think there's a game, um, uh, there's like two truths and a lie or icebreakers, that type of thing. So that I think as a teacher, using the whiteboard for the first time, what am I supposed to do with this blank canvas, tabula rasa? Uh, so that really helps. So you go, uh, if you go in and, and, and look at the, the different types of templates and structures, you can also create your own templates. So there's lots of um, ways to structure your thinking and create um, um, an experience for students that way. Um, you could create a Venn diagram or you could create completely create your own personalized template or structure that you could reuse. So I think there are infinite possibilities with whiteboard and um, the, the way you want to curate the annotation possibility for the student. Great, thank you, Simon. Uh, Pip, yeah, you mentioned the comparison to uh, the Microsoft Teams whiteboard and um, whiteboards can be a particular kind of tool. Um, <clears throat> I'm teach, in my teaching at the OU, I use Adobe Connect, uh, the Adobe Connect whiteboard, and I find it uh, quite challenging as a tool, I must say, not very user friendly, particularly for the teachers mm. rather than the students. So um, what made you choose the, the Zoom whiteboard instead of choosing something else? Was it because your institution has this um, association with Zoom and that was a kind of a one-way direction mm -hmm. really, right? Or uh, you thought that the, 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 the Zoom whiteboard had affordances that other similar tools did not have? Um, as you described, it was uh, what we were using in institutions. So it chose us rather than we choosing it. It was about looking at what tools we use and what features are available within those tools to create uh, an interactive learning experience. So, as I said, we tried the polling, we looked at breakout rooms. Um, polling seemed to work for the, for, for, for the learning context in terms of uh, the possibility of contributing in an anonymous capacity and not being frightened of making a mistake from the student's perspective. Uh, with the whiteboard, um, uh, our staff were used to sharing screen actively but they were just sharing, say, a PowerPoint file like I'm doing now. And what 
what extra layers can you put on top of sharing a screen in a PowerPoint to bring the content alive? So annotation is one way of doing that. I don't know if you can see, I'm drawing on the screen. That's very naughty yeah. and very badly okay, behaved. Okay, very say. badly behaved, but I'll use the, uh, I'll perhaps use the rubber, but uh, the eraser, they call it to, 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 to stop that. But yeah. um, so that it was really just looking at what was in the tools already. And, and there were, I think there's a tendency sometimes to say, well, oh, look at this, this is new, we'll, we'll have this. Actually, no, uh, something is new is great, but it needs to be right for us. So lots of institutions are like really streets ahead uh, in terms of um, um, technology enhanced learning, but it's about whether it's right for us. So this is very, very new um, and there was some resistance to it. And also one of the, uh, one of the, 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 the points that was interesting is how you use uh, features together like app smashing. So how could you use uh, VVox and a whiteboard together. So I, th I thought that was a really interesting, so you don't have to be stuck on one thing. We must use a whiteboard this week. No, we'll choose the right tool for the right situation at the right time. It's like an Aristotelian approach, the doctrine of the digital mean. It's easier said than done, uh, but that's one of the challenges of being a learning technologist. Okay, and I very much vouch for the Aristotelian approach in the use of learning technologies. That's a good point. Uh, the other thing I want to ask you is um, <clears throat> in relation to synchronous and asynchronous tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the context of distance learning, quite often we get quite a lot of resistance from distance learners in relation to synchronous uh, experiences, mm -hmm. synchronous activities, because they say, no, I'm not available, I don't yes. have time, I work, uh, I have a personal life, all these kind of things. Do you think that the the, this particular web whiteboard tool and their social annotation would work for uh, asynchronous activities? Yes, so the new updated whiteboard from Zoom includes this asynchronous access. And when I had a look at it and tested it, a teacher could create um, a whiteboard in advance and, and then share it live. And then students could then access it afterwards and that there could be a whiteboard thread running through a whole module or an assessment. So um, I, I actually thought that that was very good and Zoom had improved that. Um, I think students, um, sometimes when you're a distance learner, they crave a bit of live synchronous real-time interaction. Um, they want that and they actually expect it. Um, if they can't make it, I mean, we all have lives and maybe the lecturer might not be able to make it, but um, uh, in answer to your question, a simple yes, I think. Okay, okay, yeah. <clears throat> That's useful and it's very useful to encourage distance learners to, to participate in, in synchronous activities and uh, make the, the benefit for them uh, really obvious. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Pip. Thank you very much for your, for your input in the session. Really, really worthy. Right. Uh, we have another 10 minutes and uh, we have another presentation, a shorter session from Larissa, Larissa Grice from the University of London. And we are going back to computing and coding. Larissa, can you hear us and see us? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm just switching my there. camera on. <laughs> Hi. So Hi. I will start sharing my screen if you could. Uh, briefly. So in this lightning talk, um, what I would like um, to explain uh, or rather share our very fruitful uh, experience um, uh, in uh, development of uh, master's computer science uh, program on the Moodle virtual learning environment in collaboration with the Burbank University. So we started uh, developing this program about a year ago. And uh, um, so I would like to talk about two aspects of, of this development. So one aspect is um, how to, the, the challenge which we come across was um, how to um, uh, kind of uh, allow students to um, uh, do coding uh, activities uh, interactively on a Moodle. So 
those of you who worked in the Moodle, so you know the limitations of the tools or standard tools out of the toolbox. So there are no tools um, at all uh, which allow students to do coding activities. So, but there is a tool called uh, learning uh, tool interability. Uh, technology which allows actually integrate the third party or kind of external uh, systems to, to the Moodle. Um, so the, our colleague, colleagues uh, from the Bureau University, so they suggested to acquire Codio, which is an uh, um, integrated uh, development environment based on the cloud. So it meaning that students don't need to install any software locally on their local computer and do these activities, uh, coding activities um, um, uh, outside of kind of uh, Moodle environment. So, um, we, we, we purchased about 100 uh, licenses and it was a sort of learning curve for both, to, I mean, for us uh, and also for our colleagues from the Burbeck, but uh, it's, it was very successful, I would say, so very successful um, um, experience uh, and overall. Um, so the, the one aspect I would say, or one challenge would have already was resolved by, by integrating Codio to, to Moodle. But another challenge, uh, which we sort of, again, had to uh, resolve, how to ensure that the design of the modules, which include Codio, have some kind of um, um, the, the same look and feel for, for, from the student's experience viewpoint. So how we resolve that? So we um, created, um, uh, the um, template, what they called module design template, which literally was uh, included kind of predefined um, design as a such. So, and uh, this template, as you see, included, uh, consists of each, each topic, uh, sorry, each, each course consists of 10 topics. One topic spans over one week and uh, each uh, um, topic divided in number of lessons. So for example, lesson one and two uh, would include mostly acquisition, oh, sorry, acquisition type of activities. And um, the lesson three, it's interactive labs and the lesson four, uh, additional materials. So when we uh, offer this template to the um, academic subject experts, so they accepted it with the kind of gratitude because obviously it was kind of easier uh, for, for them um, in terms of the design in the course. So and um, example of the template completed, uh, that, that's, that's kind of example. So as you see, the first, first uh, um, lesson uh, consists of, as I said, mostly acquisition type of activities, the video readings, and uh, uh, also lesson two. But lesson three, it always interactive labs. So um, the, how this is all look like on, on the VLE, uh, that's the example. So this is the, um, I would say, now I would say typical <laughs> module on the computer science, um, master's computer science uh, uh, program. So uh, which, uh, as I said, include um, lesson one, uh, lesson two and interactive labs. So interactive labs, when student uh, click on the programming problem uh, link, LTI link, this would open a uh, new window uh, with the Codio uh, and the students would see this uh, window. Yeah, so students would see this window. I'm just, yes, it's a bit slow. And um, uh, right, so, and um, if for example, students click programming problem. So this would, again, I will open, I'll open all windows, just prepare in advance. And that's what sort of activities will students see. So this is environment what students would see. Um, right, so uh, the beauty of um, Codio is that um, uh, on the light, uh, le left uh, hand uh, pane, obviously students can do some coding and then, then they can click check in and get the immediate feedback. And um, uh, all instructions actually provided to, to, to them here. So 
I've, I've done nothing. So if I click check in, so yeah, so obviously yeah, I'm failed because I've, I've done nothing. <laughs> so if I click next, so uh, the code also allows uh, to include some self-assessment quizzes. So, and uh, again, the beauty of this is that um, the, the immediate uh, feedback is uh, given to students. Oops, okay, so it takes a while to, to uh, upload this. Right, so um, yeah, so it's possible to do as, as, as many um, uh, sort of activities as, as um, necessary. So again, it's all sort of uh, interactive, I would say, um, um, uh, set up here. So what's happened is, so how kind of the work was divided between, um, between us and our colleagues uh, um, uh, at the Burbeck. So we just helped to set everything up on a Moodle. So, uh, and, um, and then uh, the rest of the, the assessments was obviously set up by, by, by the academics themselves. So um, all the assessments, formative assessments and the summative assessments all take place on the Kodio. Students sub submit everything on the Kodio and the rubrics also can be including actually the coursework and the auto graded um, uh, assignment summative ones as well. So it's all done here and um, rubrics, marking rubrics also can be set up here. And um, yeah, so, and uh, we've done very brief kind of evaluation or rather survey uh, at the end of, um, yes, a session, first session was about October last year. And uh, we received quite positive um, feedback uh, for, from the students. But again, um, having said that, I have to admit that was a learning curve for us, but it's, it's, it's obviously the success now because almost every single module in this program uh, is using Codio now. So, right, so that's all. I think I've used my five minutes. <laughs> I'll stop now. <laughs> that was very interesting, uh, Larissa, and it touches on a very important uh, 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 problem uh, institutions have, how to create uh, uh, labs online, how to make them pedagogically valid for the students. Um, so do you say that the current program uses uh, exclusively these, uh, these Codio Labs? There are, no, are there any face-to-face -face or computer, uh, computer, physical computer labs for, for students? Uh, no, because this master's computer science uh, program is a fully online distance learning asynchronous program. Yeah. So um, normally um, students have about three webinar sessions. So one in the beginning, uh, just kind of introduction to, to the course, another one about in the middle, just to check in the progress. And then the last one about closer to the end of the course uh, when the students uh, start um, uh, doing the coursework. So, and the, all the um, webinars being uh, held um, uh, on the Blackboard Collaborate. So that's sort of uh, information normally included here and announcement normally posted uh, to the, um, um, through the, the module announcement or online tutor forum. So when the students actually know when the webinars uh, would take place. So um, it would be very interesting actually to use a handle <laughs> as well <laughs> on, this, on this program. <laughs> so maybe there is an opportunity here <laughs> because again, as I said, Moodle is, is, is quite limited uh, uh, specifically when it comes to the um, sort of uh, interaction between students. So it's just the discussion forums, which students sometimes oppose, sometimes not. So I can't say that they very much uh, sort of, um, um, it, I mean, obviously students use them, but because there is nothing else, <laughs> I would say, there is no alternative for, for students. But uh, yeah, so that, that would be good to, to kind of try something else new, I would say. <laughs> That's very, very, very uh, useful, very, very exciting in mm -hmm. the context of distant learning. We are extremely excited seeing solutions that allow uh, distant learners to, to have this kind of interactivity and to, to uh, simulate successfully uh, labs in disciplines like computer science. 
Larissa, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks very much for Th your input. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for your thanks to the presenters and the audience. Uh, well, we are moving towards the end of this uh, session. There's going to be a break, and then uh, there's a prize, and there is a, a, another panel at 12 o'clock. Nice, nice seeing you all. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the Thank conference. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.